This is the When Work Isn't Work podcast. This podcast exists to help people reignite the love of what they do in a post-pandemic world. The pandemic gave us a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reflect on what is truly important to us in work and in life. I'm your host, Sinead Connolly, co-founder and director of Lotus People, an award-winning Sydney-based recruitment agency. We hope you enjoy today's chat. Hello, today I am joined by the wonderful Josh McCall, who is well known within the recruitment industry in Sydney for being an absolute bundle of high energy. <laughs> Josh, you were the first person to pop up in my LinkedIn feed this morning after the uh, the recruitment awards last night. Welcome to the podcast. How was the head? <laughs> <laughs> um, good, it's good. I um, I think I'm probably most well known on LinkedIn because I post on there five times a week or four yeah. times. <laughs> um, honestly, fine. I, I dipped out early. Um, I kind of did the yeah, big... Yeah smoke bomb um as people would know um but it was a, it was a really good night it was my first tiaras so yeah awesome yeah. those industry awards i lotus are known for the fact that we do tend to go for them and um the whole process i find is just from an agency and business owner perspective the process of writing the awards reflecting on what you've done tracking data um, putting in place things that you want to do for the next award submission, it, that process in itself is a, a process of improvement. But then when you actually get to the awards, see all the industry, celebrate all of the success, see all of the people who are the shining stars and doing very good work within um, the industry, it really is like it's so good for morale. It's so like there is an energy to it, which is amazing. Yeah, and it's it's something I've sort of noticed. I've, I've been traveling a bit the last few weeks and it's back in in-person events and doing all of that. There's this, I think there's a buzz coming back, not just in Sydney, but I think I, I've been in New Zealand, I've been in Brisbane. I think everyone's sort of getting back to that what, three or four years ago when everyone was at Ryan's Bar in the city at recruitment? <laughs> um, I think that's slowly creeping back in, um, which is exciting. It's a niche reference that I love it. If you know, you know. <laughs> um, no, it is exciting. And it's, it's even this podcast, it was born on the premise of post COVID. There are things that we want to cling on to. And we've spoken at length um, about the things that we don't want to let go and the things that we want to take from it. But at the same time, I think some of the things that can go in the bin is the lack of constant like lack of human interaction so when we have those moments and those kind of anchor points where we all get to be together and people are excited by the energy we can create in a room um i think it's it, it's nice it's nice to be able to have that back yeah Amazing. it's exciting it's it's mm. changing i think and it's it's a good shift i think especially at the holiday period a hundred percent it's so funny we have launched straight into chat and we haven't even given any context okay. about you <laughs> no it's amazing it's a good indicator for what's to come good solid wholesome chats um can you for context Josh give us an idea of your role um and what you're doing today in your career yeah so I'm an account executive I deal in sort of the tech space so it, uh, people will be familiar with the product Bullhorn. Um, I look after the APAC region and I sort of sit between 20, 20 users through and above. So I've been with Bullhorn for two years now almost. Um, I look after a full suite of products, really just it's essentially consulting customers on what are they doing with their ATS CRM, their workflows and, and the like there and what they could be doing better. All within the recruitment industry for yeah. years. <laughs> yes, exactly. Something in another life to end up in our wonderful industry. <laughs> I've, I've, yeah, lived a few lives, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, on that note, then the the living a few lives. What have you done in your pathway to get here? Because you do love what you do. It shines and emanates through when we speak, when I see you in person, um, when I see you online and the personal brand that you've built, like I can see that it is genuine. There's an authenticity to your love of whether it's the industry, whether it's the um, clients that you work with, the people that you work with, the people who are kind of changing the industry. Um, there's definitely that passion there, but no doubt that journey is not um, linear. <laughs> so talk me through the, uh, the twists and turns that got you to this stage. It, it, yeah, it's interesting because it hasn't, I think I've been in jobs before where I've just been in jobs. So I'm originally from the Hunter Valley. Um, so three hours north of Sydney for those that are listening that may not know. Um, so I grew up there, born and raised. 
Um, and then I was a manager at McDonald's from sort of 18 through to 21. Yeah. Yeah. I was like a store manager and it's great foundations, great trainings. Everyone says that when they see McDonald's on a resume, but yeah, I was like, I, know that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm overworking 50, 60 hours a week, not knowing what was to come as you get older, that you're still going to be doing that probably sometimes. But I moved into a sales role and it was my first ever sales role. I didn't want to go to university. It wasn't sort of my career path line. So I went into a sales role selling a property tax depreciation calculator on a website. And it is as boring as you'd imagine. Um, So I did that for five years. I was traveling Australia. So I did 26 weeks a year travel. Um, and I was, yeah, I was like, I'm living out of a suitcase. I'm not sort of being able to maintain friendships, relationships, anything of the like. So moved to Sydney with that company, helped them set up an office here in Sydney. And then the, then I moved out of there and I went into client relationships for a design and construction company across ANZ. Um, it, it was helping do some floors in LinkedIn, doing the design and build, doing the Uber offices around Australia and New Zealand. Great work. But after a year, the business was like, okay, we're going to expand it out. Um, would you like to just do New South Wales? And I was like, you know what? I'm never going to pick up a hammer in my life. So I think there's not a, there's not an alignment here. Yeah. Um, and that <laughs> I went to a recruitment agency um, and that's sort of where I – first really got exposure to recruitment um and i was with them for two and a half years three years i was with them for five years i was doing recruitment for them for about two years two and a half years um doing tech recruitment so contract tech recruitment so software digital infrastructure cloud i was doing the whole vertical because they hadn't had that built out for them before um and then bullhorn came knocking um, and when Bullhorn came knocking, they got me at the right time. I actually had a recruiter reach out to me that used to do in-house recruitment for us at our recruitment agency. She's like, hey, Josh, are you are you looking? And I was like, do you know what? I am. And she's like, great. Well, they want to talk to you. And I was like, fantastic. So went through the interview process. I think I did five interviews in a week for Bullhorn. Um, yeah. yeah, I re- <laughs> yeah I one of them. <laughs> Well, one of them was on a Friday night at 7 p.m. And I remember it was with our MD, Aaron McIntosh, and our VP of sales, Andy Ingham. And they were like, so is there anything that's going to make you not take this job? And I was like, it is 7 p.m. on a Friday night. I'm on a call with you, I think. (laughs) (laughs) There are many places I could be other than this place right here, right now. Yeah. And in your your journey to Bullhorn, and and obviously the rest is history in in your journey there, um, the roles are very different like the, the different jobs you've held have like there's obviously similarities between them but was there when you were kind of going you were tapped on the shoulder and you decided yep yeah, bullhorn is the the thing for me that's what I want to go were there sort of um similar threads through what you've done previously that felt like this sort of packaged up um that like have you did you have any sort of reflection piece in it or was it kind of like moving on when you're ready and thinking about it at that point with with the first job where I was doing the design the, with the tax depreciation calculator, that was I felt I'd hit a concrete ceiling. I had done everything that I could five years in a row. I was sort of one of the top sort of billers, done all that. There was no room for progression. And I think that's always something that I've looked at is what is my next step? Um, I'm 31 now and I've always sort of since I've sort of been around 25 been like, okay, what's my next step? What do the next few years look like? At least give me a skeleton framework. Mm-hmm. Um, I was having a chat. Uh, I was in one of my one-to-ones, and my boss was like, "It's eighty percent you, twenty percent us. We'll give you the guidelines. Mm-hmm. It's it's on you." And I was like, "Great, I love this mentality now because I never sort of had that. I had that with my recruitment job, um, and then our leader had left the business. She was a very big influence on sort of me actually becoming a better salesman or mm-hmm. a better person to work with. I think as well." Yeah. Um, and that's sort of something that I've tried to thread through, so which is really cool. Yeah, that's awesome, and it's um, it's so great when you have those leaders and you have those people to aspire to and to learn from. I think we turn into sponges when we are those types of people who are thinking about the next thing. You you do tend to become a sponge when you're surrounded by those people. Um, and you mentioned with your role now that you're you've been traveling a lot the world is opening the industry is opening I know from even when I speak with you and see you out and about uh, out and about at events you're so high energy 
you're so extroverted in your way like in terms of managing the balance of sort of success in sales which you would associate with extroversion I'm an introvert in a running a sales business which is an interesting dynamic I'm an extroverted introvert but I'm definitely an introvert um so I know that this for me is always a constant battle but from your perspective like b- managing and navigating that sort of balance of success and needing to be seen and out in the world but also with kind of the mental health piece and the wellness piece and we're well out of mental health month now um because we have to cancel this I had to cancel this through covid through a cold so you've been so patient in uh, in getting us through this but we figured hey october's over but we still know that mental health awareness it, it continues beyond the the month that has dedicated to it um but yes how do you find that balance look it's i'm an extroverted personality normally like i no matter what i do i'm pretty out there but the the reality of it is like monday to friday nine times out of ten I'm at home on the lounge with a dog as soon as it hits sort of 5.30. So I'm in the office every day. I have to be in the office sort of every day. It helps me. Like I'm ADHD, so it helps me align with that. And that probably contributes to being extroverted. But I had this, that leader that I was talking of, her name's Sally Carr, fantastic leader. She had this thing that she always sort of ingrained in me is like bring your whole self to work but make sure that you have that work-life balance. So I get to the office every morning at about 7.30 probably is the latest that I'll get in. I'm a hard stop at five unless it's super important. And that gives me my time to unwind. So walking to the office, walking home from the office, that's my, that's my me time. Uh, That is my unwind down, chill down. So then when you're at the events and you're out and about, it's okay, how do you balance that then? And that's the part that sometimes you can struggle with. Um, So I, I, I do a lot of running when I can sort of getting back into that now. And I've noticed that I, when I'm not running, I'm not having something for me, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it's being able to actually say like, this is my hard boundaries. We're not stepping over them. That's something that I've really made a massive focus on sort of in the last three years, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Because with sales, it's ebbs and flows, like especially in the sales that I do, you have to sort of look at what are your little wins because it may be 90 to 120 days before you get a signature on a contract Mm -hmm. and you have to be okay with that. So the next step, them saying, yeah, let's catch up for a coffee or let's lock in the next call. They're little wins that you have to be like, yeah, that's my little hit of euphoria essentially in that process. (laughs) Through strong. (laughs) All at the end or you'll be starved of dopamine. (laughs) Um, no it's such a good point and I think the hard boundaries it's it's something that comes up again and you listen to the podcast right so you'll you'll know (laughs) um the um the the um hard boundaries it comes up constantly and I think it's something that it's so it does come up all the time and it, it is obvious but it's also so difficult to maintain like it's so so tricky like this week for me is a perfect example um as I said I had COVID um last week like the week before that I had a cold and then I um exercising I did my back out so like literally I've just been like this absolute kind of mess for the last few weeks and this week Monday morning I woke up healthy I woke up with full energy I was so excited and by Wednesday I'd burnt myself <laughs> I was doing like ridiculous hours. I was like approaching everything with a level of intensity that isn't sustainable. And now it's Friday. My voice is gravelly again and I'm tired and I'm feeling like my nervous system's been on overdrive. And I, honestly, I was catching up with two of my friends yesterday and I was like, it's one of those things where I just question like, how, how am I still here? How am I at the age of 34 running a business and I still don't have the ability to fully navigate my own energy so it's it's really tricky so if you're reaching the point where you're putting boundaries in place and you're dispersing your energy well you're going on the right path I would say <laughs> well, it's we get a group like our message in the group chat every Friday between me and the boys is what's everyone doing this weekend or what's everyone doing tonight and this morning yeah. I read it and I was like I am staying home yeah. I'm not doing a thing cut to 7 p.m I'll probably be at one of their houses just having a beer on the balcony but I am like I am but staying now. home <laughs> but now I'm staying at home I'm not doing a thing like I just need to recover like yeah. it's that yeah. thing it's like because you you miss out on like you miss out on a bit so you're like I need to re I need to catch up on all this all at once yeah. And like yeah. you go into overdrive. 
yes yes and I noticed that like I actually do and I have done this week you tip into a place where you're in overdrive your nervous system's in overdrive and I pick up my phone and it's like the very quick even though I'm exhausted my brain is craving my tired brain is craving the dopamine hit open the emails again tiny dopamine hit open LinkedIn again but almost to the point where I keep opening them and nothing new has happened because I clicked into it 15 seconds ago and that's when I know I'm tired if I'm coming from a place of stable normal calm energy where everything is just being done in a reasonable time then I don't get that kind of manic craving to like have that like release that dopamine hit on myself but that's when I that's like a signifier for me like I when I see that I'm like okay mate throw your phone in the bin (laughs) get rid of it and go and sit and stare at a wall and meditate for a while because that's where you're at (laughs) do you find the same with like I I know what my triggers are for when I'm getting burnt out I become a little bit irritable Like I become Mm -hmm. a little bit irritable where Mm -hmm. I'm like, I just need everyone just to leave me alone for a minute. Let me just focus on what I'm doing because like my ADHD will go into overdrive and I can't focus and I'll be like, okay, like what am I doing now? Like I was cleaning the house. We did spring clean last weekend. I was, I was literally cleaning the cupboards, wiping down the cupboards. And then I realized that the laundry had finished. So I went upstairs, finished, hung out the laundry and then I was sweeping the back balcony. And Jack yelled at me from downstairs. He's like, Josh, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm sweeping the balcony. He's like, are you going to finish the cupboards? And I was like, (laughs) like, this is coming up sort of three weeks of travel. And then it's just, it's it's controlled chaos, I call it. Like I have this controlled chaos energy to me when I'm burnt out that I need to just do this. Like I just need to lay in bed. Like I just yeah. need to lay in bed, lay on the lounge, read a book, do something yeah. that is keeping my mind focused yeah. or completely switched off. There's no sort of in between. Yeah. It's recharging um, the batteries, right? It's like yeah. I can tell that I'm running on empty and I'm being slightly demented and demonic because I'm running on empty. So I'm going to have to lock myself in a room and plug up. I remember listening to a podcast once um, and there was a psychologist on it and they were talking about um, how when you're operating throughout the course of a day, you should picture yourself with a battery, um, like the way your iPhone has the number, like your battery yeah. and, the and like 79% or 12%. And I really, and, and also like when you get to, I can't remember where I, I'm repeating this, but I can't remember where I heard it from. But it's like when you get to 1% and you plug out your phone, uh, sorry, you get to 1% and you don't plug in your phone and your phone dies, it takes ages to get it back up get to... Back. Um, 1% and then you're like okay finally it's blinkered it's flickered it's died then you have to get it back to 1% and it's like I actually have started thinking about that my energy in that way of like this week I think I've been hovering under 30% and yeah. normally it would be of course up in the 60s 70s 80s 90s um, so yeah it's a fun then when you get to that end you start flickering you start like your phone starts like freezing you start like uh, cleaning cupboards <laughs> and then walking upstairs and sweeping so so yeah. balconies it's thing <laughs> i was because i was thinking on the walk in this morning i was like do you know what this is probably the best time for me to be having this podcast like actually having this chat because the last last week i was burnt out like i had a mm-hmm. meeting like like we're very like our, our company's really good at identifying uh people being burnt out are they do they need a bit of time checking in how are things going where can we help where can we assist and I hadn't even really started to notice the signs until last week that I was getting burnt out. Um, and my, like, my boss was like, what's going on? He goes like, you just seem like not yourself at the moment, which is really cool to be able to have those open and honest conversations. And I was like, oh, do you know what? Like, I, I am. And he, he was saying, he was like, I think you're burning the candle at both ends. He goes, you have this thing where... And it sounds, it's, it's a cliche answer when people are like, tell me what one of your weaknesses are. And it's, I take on too much, but <laughs> I, I do. I'll say yes to everything. If yeah. I can, I'm like superwoman, like Wonder Woman. Like I have the capacity to take on everything in my yeah. mind. But yes. I was just, I was just, yeah, like I needed, I'm in Sydney for a week this week and I'm so happy about it. And I'm like, okay, I'm back home. I'm ground, I'm finding myself getting regrounded. Really and yeah. I think it's just this lead up to sort of Christmas. Everything's yeah. trying to do every, everyone's trying to do everything all at once. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, you've it's got to keep ar- that pace. Deadline. Yeah, it is. It's an arbitrary right. deadline. And you're right. We do have to keep up that pace. And I've been really strict with it this year. My parents are here for a year. 
Um, and I think in normal life, I would just be saying yes, 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 mindlessly to everything. But because they're here, it just gives me a point for pause to say, okay, well, what do I have on with them? And is it something that they would want to go to? And I just, I think about it more because it's not just me. I'm not like, yeah, cool, coming. Yep, yeah, I'll be at that. And so I really noticed that, that I have a little bit more mindfulness in it. And I think it's it's a tricky time of year in Sydney and Australia because it is so busy but then at the same time everyone wants everything done every and it's all self-imposed again my workload is all what I give myself and what I take on and I'm like you I get literally told by my friends uh, Laura and Michelle have both been on the podcast and even as you were talking about that um, about having that ability to kind of take on everything that's what I do I'm like I would like to do all these things all of that is within my wheelhouse yes to everything and then it's like you only have this many hours in the week but the desire to want to do 10 times more is something that does me in every time it's like this week it's like a three weeks essentially or two or three weeks of work to catch up on and I'm like I'll finish it by Tuesday <laughs> and then on Wednesday I'm like I'm burnt out <laughs> It just just you saying that makes me think of the first episode that you did for the podcast where you're like, I've been trying to do this for ages, but everyone's been telling me, no, you don't have the capacity to do this. Exactly. This is exactly it. Is. But oh, even I was out at a client yesterday and they're recruiters. They're like, yep, I've got so many open things that we need to fill by the end of the year. And, and they're like, we don't know how we're going to get it all done. And I was like, what are you going to do? And they're like, we don't have a plan in place. We're just going to sort of spray and spray and pray, trying to get as much in as we can this side of the year. And then I went to a completely different customer and like, yeah, we're stopping work. We're rejecting work at the moment yeah, yeah, yeah. because we're saying we don't want our people to burn out before Christmas because I think yeah. it's historically in the Australian workforce, it's always been this mindset of the mad dash to Christmas. Yeah, it's always yeah. been that and everyone burns out so they don't actually get to enjoy their holiday period. Yeah, and you spend that first week trying to catch up on sleep, trying to – you're either in this pit of self-loathe because you didn't hit your number for the year or you didn't hit your target for the quarter or something like that, so you're not really enjoying those first few days because you're, you're mad at yourself almost. And yeah. it's about being able to separate – and I think a lot of businesses are doing it now where they're trying to help people separate state and house almost – where they yeah. say work is work, let's keep it at work, yeah. home is home. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really love that comparison between the two businesses. I think that is such a good way of um, managing it. It's such a nice thing to have that awareness, and it is about countering it. We um, said to the team yesterday, um, we have – our standard hybrid model which is two days in the yeah. office we have um four weeks a year of lotus global and a few of the team are taking it up for the next few weeks one's going to new zealand another two are going to um bali so people are taking advantage of it but then we've also said look we're basically going to close the office from the 19th like the actual physical office rather than the work <laughs> from 19th through to the the 9th um and people can just work remote and hopefully people will take advantage of that and go interstate or go up and down the coast or whatever and i think that's going to be a you know matter like in normal life it would be you're working you still come into the city but i think even the separation if you're doing the hours and you're not on leave hopefully that separation will allow people to feel more chill and condense kind of like all of the madness of the year rather than having condensed you actually get to kind of um yeah expand and enjoy the the break i suppose yeah we're we're actually looking at trying to get away to a have you ever heard of unyoked properties so no. unyoked is a website where it's an air, it's almost like an airbnb website you go i done it i did it for my birthday this year and you barely have any reception we were out near mudgy oh. Um, it's like a little ca tiny cabin on a big property. The idea is there's probably two other cabins on there and you're not meant to see anyone. <gasps> like you're not meant to see any of the other guests at all. And we, we went down there, we took the dog and that was, we did that for my birthday weekend this year. And it was the first time I've had a birthday where I have not been contacted by anyone from work, apart from a message saying, have a great time. Wow. And that switch off. So we're looking at doing that again over Christmas. And Amazing. that's sort of what, I was like, if I just do five days of that, that's brilliant yeah. for me. Like that yeah. is all that I need to recharge, recharge. the batteries. Yeah. Like, Cause we go, we're going over to Boston as a company in January, Amazing. which is really cool. We're doing a sales kickoff with the whole company. Um, and it's going to be great. Cause it's going to be the first time in the two years that I've been with Bullhorn that I get to meet the rest of the team. Yeah. So I'm like, I want to make sure that I'm bringing my whole self there and I'm fully yeah. recharged and, <laughs> 
<laughs> full energy bundle. <laughs> <laughs> because it's five days of not being able to hide. It's going to, yeah. it's going to be on 24-7. So yeah. I won't be um, able to retreat back to my lounge and watch The Real Housewives no. when I want to. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be, it's gonna be on. That'll be so lovely. I'm definitely adding on Yoat to my um, my list to check out. That sounds incredible. And it's funny how we live in such a digitized world that we all need to actually get to the stage where our phones are phys- like physically they no longer work in order right. for us to um, to actually <laughs> take a break from it. Um, and in terms of your, I know you mentioned your ADHD. Um, you've obviously heard on the podcast. You've had conversations around it. Laura's spoken a lot and very openly about it. How? Is that an adult or child diagnosis? How has that manifested both from like a, I guess, mental health perspective and also a self-awareness perspective? Because it's a tricky thing to obviously have to not be, the world is made for neurotypical people. So there is an element of masking and adjustment that has to come with being ADHD. Yeah, look, it's it's interesting. So Laura's podcast, Laura's episode, fantastic. I messaged her on LinkedIn. And I was like, this was brilliant. Like, uh, this was so good. Some of the stuff that she highlighted, I was like, oh, well, we you don't really talk about it a lot as an adult. So I got diagnosed when I was five, okay, um, yeah. and I was on Ritalin and Catapress, the two common medications. Then when I was in '96 or whatever, um, and then I, it was it was interesting because at school I was always sort of at the top end of class and I was in that intelligent piece but I just could not focus like I couldn't focus I school wasn't my thing um but I went through did year 12 and it was interesting because then you add being a queer male into the mix so when I was 16 you're already thinking like is there something wrong with me and then you're like with with the ADHD piece of it because there was at that time there wasn't many people diagnosed I think a lot more people are getting diagnosed later in life now when they're in their late 20s early 30s so at my time it was me and three other kids in my school that had ADHD and then so I was already going through that I was like oh god something's wrong with me I'm a bad kid and then I'd been queer in the mix you then you start to realize like it was probably when I was 18 six between 16 and 18 This podcast is sponsored by Lotus People Recruitment. We are an award-winning Sydney-based recruitment agency with a genuine human-first and innovative approach. Lotus People are disrupting the recruitment industry by placing quality and service at the heart of all we do. Recruiting roles across HR, talent, business support, and much more. Head to our website today for more information if you are a job seeker or an employer hiring staff. We're at lotuspeople.com.au. I stopped my medication. So I was like, I'm going to make myself focus. Like, <laughs> no idea why I thought I could. Um, a, lot a lot of pressure. I'm actually going to uh, just, just do this all on my own. And who needs yeah. any intervention? It's a lot of pressure to put on a person. Well, my mindset was I didn't want to be taking tablets for the rest of my life. Yeah, that enough. was the thing. I was like, I didn't want to have to take tablets for the rest of my life. And then I went off the medication. And it was really an interesting turn because – I had a lot more control of myself and my emotions because mm. it helps to press emotions. A lot of the medication that I was on, but then you're like, Oh, I'm feeling a lot of these things for the first time, whether it be a lot of anger, whether it be um, sad, like extreme sadness and all that stuff. So it was like me going into therapy was probably the best thing that I've ever done. Like I mm. have a therapist to see them once a week. And it's just oh, once a fortnight now we're at, which is great, but it's just chatting to them and being like, Oh, this is what's mm. going on in my life how would you navigate this? And that's mm-hmm. something that I think is really, really important. And mm-hmm. I think one of the really cool things in the last sort of five years that I've seen in the world, it's sort of changed is a lot more people are openly talking about going to therapy for work, for personal, for whatever they need it for. And there's this stigma, especially in men going to therapy. Like I think that's a really cool thing that now people are openly talking about it. a lot more, I have a lot of straight male friends and they, they're they talking about it more. They're talking about their feelings, their emotions. One of my housemates, Harry, one of the most in tune with his emotions, heterosexual males I've ever met in my life, more in tune than I am. Mm. And that's it's a really nice thing to see. Mm-hmm. I think they're really, really cool to see now. And I think that's the way that the world's shifting. I think yes. if I hadn't noticed it early, then I would have been a lot worse off now. 
Yeah, one hundred percent. That makes sense. But it sense. comes with its bumps. It comes with its yeah. bumps along the way. Still, mm-hmm. like it's, I have to have my calendar at work color coded and blocked out, even for lunch. My walk to my travel to and from work. Yeah. Like I need to have it meticulous. Yeah. Yeah, like, because you lean on that, right? That will then be the the anchor, the guiding kind of um, yeah focus of your day. It's like, where am I meant to be? Okay, it's all in here. Like it's uh, yeah. it's something to support you in knowing where to go. Yeah, and that's yeah. the that's the thing is, is like I'm like okay, this is my framework, and I have to have that yeah. framework yeah. because then when I'm out of work, I'm like la di da, like hands off. <laughs> I try yeah. to go with the flow. I think a lot of my friends would say I probably don't go with the flow. I need to know the plan still. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't need it to be planned in the diary. You don't need it color coded. No. You don't need every hour accounted for. It. <laughs> no, you just want like... a big, big outline, please. I'm like that. <laughs> I'm like, what time do you need me there? What time do yeah. I need to be <laughs> like yeah. that thing? Um, yeah. But yeah. No, I and I th- completely agree with you around the tech therapy piece and around how our generation, like I think, <clears throat> and particularly the newer generation coming coming through as well. I just think there's so much awareness around the the conversation of mental health, and we're also open about it. And I think our parents' generation, it just wasn't a done thing. I know we're called the snowflake generation, us millennials, but mm-hmm. there is there's something to it. Like I know for a fact that. Um, all of many of my friends, all of my friends, many of my friends have, have been to therapy and we've all sort of gone through that process. And then the conversations you end up having with each other, they're elevated because you're speaking through your own learnings through those conversations. So everyone, like the broader tribe, the broader community gets to benefit from it because everyone's bringing their own, not only is it information from professionals and from people who are aware of mental health, but it's also distilled through these, our friends, these individuals experiences as well. So, and then it's being brought back and shared and kind of um, you can decide, take bits and pieces of decide what you want to, to take on board. So it's, it is different. I love it. I don't know how I'm so open about mental health. I, definitely can suffer from anxiety um and i definitely am oversensitive in that like my nervous system is so precarious in that like loud noises i went to a restaurant the other night and it was like being in a nightclub it was so noisy it was a restaurant in newtown that i was like this is literally a nightclub and i know that makes me sound a hundred but like it wasn't even like oh this is noisy i could just feel my whole nervous system everything in me was just like heightened and i wanted to flee my whole body i was like i want to run this is so offensive to me uh, but then that impacts on work and my concentration and my burnout and my energy levels so it's having the awareness having the language having the openness and the ability to talk through it i think is is absolutely crucial uh, particularly as you say like there's from your experience it's adhd you're not neurotypical you're finding out at a young age you're the odd one out and then as you say being queer, being in the gay community, that whole experience, it's like layering things of I don't fit into what society tells you that you should be. Um, so I imagine picking all of that apart is, um, is it's a lot. It's a lot for anyone. <laughs> it, it was very much one of those like square peg round holes. You had the right yeah. pieces of the puzzle, but you're that toddler trying to put the circle in yeah. a star shape. And you're like, hang on, that one's yeah. meant to go over here. You don't realize it until you're like in your 20s. You're like, oh, this one goes over here now. And then this yeah. one goes here. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an experience and I think you become better for it. Um, 100% from that, like you learn from it. You have to look at the positive of it. (laughs) And do you feel like having gone through the experiences being someone who is obviously focused on sort of self-betterment or self-awareness and and obviously kind of getting to know yourself and your emotional world better do you feel like you have reached the benefits of that like do you feel like you are kind of in a better place of acceptance and understanding of of you as you are today I I think in the last three years 100 percent in the last three years definitely the last 24 months I've taken a sort of long sort of time and I think my job was a big part of it. So that leader that I'd mentioned, she'd left the business and that was a big blow for the business, to be honest with you. Like when she'd left, um, because she was what I like to see myself as now within Bullhorn. She was this person that comes in, she would come in every morning and she'd be like, Josh, put it on. And we'd put on Dolly Parton nine to five every single morning. I every love single that. morning. Josh, put it on. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Like it would be just her and I singing to Dolly Parton. And she just had this energy and this aura that made you want to work for her. And yeah, she, she was the one that got you bought into the vision. She was yeah. the rocket ship that was going to take it to new heights. So when she moved on, there was this gap in my work life. And I was like, oh, and then I had things going on personally. And I was like, oh, everything just started to compound. And I really sort of let my mental health go a bit. And then I was like, what's, what are these, what's going on? What are the big things? And one of them was my job. It was, the reality was I didn't, a great company to work for, but I didn't believe in the vision anymore. Uh, I didn't know what their vision was anymore. So that was a big piece of it. So I was going into work every day and I wasn't buying into what I was doing. So that was, I was in an unfulfilled job and I was like, God, I'm 27. Is this what my life is meant to be like? That what was me piece. And I was like, hang on a second, that's not you. So I was like, okay, what are we going to do about it? And we got into the new job, got with Bullhorn. And I, going through that interview process, I was, remember I was saying to them, I was like, what's your investment into the R&D? What is the company vision? What does that mean? What's your turnover been like as a business over COVID? How many people have you stood down? Mm-hmm. Can I see your product roadmap? <laughs> All this stuff that if I would have known that before, yeah. I would have made smarter decisions in my career. And all of the stuff I was like, okay, this aligns with me. I was like, what do you stand for? Like, what do you do as charitable stuff? You're a big company. Like, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And I head up our, our impact arm, which is our charity arm, which is great. Cause I was like, I want to be going into a job where I can do things like this, where I can come onto a podcast and just talk openly and honestly and not be um, scripted. If that makes sense yeah. that I yeah, can do charity stuff in the interim that I can say to my boss, Hey, I need a mental health day. I need a day for me. I'm just burning out. I need a day or I need an afternoon or something. And they were the big things that really in the last two years has changed. I having the job that I was like, I'm bought into the job again. I can focus on the personal stuff. It gives me the time to focus on my personal stuff. And now it makes me so much more self-aware of where I'm, where I could be tripping up or where these triggers could come from yeah you're right it's such an important thing to have the container of that because if you have the container of feeling psychologically safe and that wellness is an awareness and that mental health at work is understood and given time to then within that all you have to focus on is you and how you control your yourself and your own energy and how you manage that and I think if people who are listening who mightn't necessarily be in an environment where with their um workplace where there's I guess an awareness of mental health or whether it just isn't that sort of um openness about it then they're battling that and they're dealing with their own we all have our own mad issues as well but like there's there's two things that you're trying to tackle so I think when you can align yourself with a business with a vision and you know what they stand for um, then it, it, half the job is done because you're not then doubling up the workload. You're not taking on the responsibility of two, <laughs> two different perspectives. Um, and we've done the same with Lotus with the mental health days. We've um, everyone gets a one wellness day in a quarter, and there's no questions asked, and people take it, and people need it, and um, it's yeah, it's a, a very important thing. And I think the fact that it's how that's received, any business can do it. But if the, on the day that someone says, hey, I want to take my mental health day today, hey, I want to take my wellness day, if, if that's sort of reacted or responded to with a, mm, I don't know about that, well, you've got a lot of work on or it's not really a day, are you sick? Like if, if that's the reaction, it's literally completely redundant. You may as well not have it. So it is all about kind of creating that culture. So it's great that you've experienced that where you are and that you're enjoying it and um yeah feeling like all of those things are addressed which is obviously super important um and thinking about i guess going back we're speaking a lot about the recruitment industry but thinking about the industry from your perspective i mean how good do you think our industry is with diversity whether it's um sort of neurodivergence diversity or obviously um equality or anything else or mental health like how do you think our industry goes and i know not every industry is perfect but where do you sort of see the gaps given that you have this insight across so many different amazing businesses yeah i i, I the recruitment industry has made a massive um push for making mental health a priority in their industry i've seen it from customers that i'm talking to 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 prospective customers that i'm talking to it's important to them 
it, I think one of the days where people are, the agencies are saying people are important to us or our people are important to us, but they're actually starting to action it. Obviously, like anything, um, like any business, there's room for improvement in certain areas. Um, I think businesses uh, that come to mind, like yourself, um, doing the what you raised 60k for the um, sleep out. Um, yeah. Thank you for doing yeah, Which is amazing. Which is amazing. Erin from Firesoft, who you've had on the yes. podcast, they do the Hunger Project. Yes. It's they're amazing. starting to put people are starting to put their money where their mouth is, which is really exciting to see. And they're starting mm-hmm. to give back. And they, they're really starting to give their people something to be proud of their place that they work in. Yeah. When we look at sort of diversity and inclusion across the industry, I think I made a post about this a couple of weeks ago. And it's it's really interesting because we've we've been hammered with the, the phrase diversity and inclusion for a very long time. And we've just got our heads around that. And we've done a really good piece on that. But I was at an event a couple of weeks ago in New Zealand and a Maori man had said it should be representation and inclusion. And I didn't Mm. understand what he meant at first about that. And he was like, well, think of indigenous people, um, traditional landowners. They're not diverse to the workforce. They just Mm. need representation. Somebody Mm. with a disability doesn't need, they're not diverse to the Australian or the, the population. They're just, need representation a bit more and I think it's this thing is we've done this really good job as a recruitment industry to really fight to get a seat at the table for women and queer men in particular Mm. Um, I think we've done a really good job about that but like I I remember I was reading in Australia uh, alone um, it's something it's five percent of the population makes up a non-European um, or Indigenous background. That's 5% yeah. of our whole population make up our C-suite. And then you go down a little bit further, 74% of people are saying that it's really important to be out at work to everyone, mm-hmm. but only 32% of them are. Yeah, and then okay. you, like, it's just, it's all this really interesting stuff, like three, yeah. 34.2% or something. These are stats. I know I know my stats. I've looked at them. Um, 34, 34% of Australia's workforce is women in the C-suite. But then you break yeah. that down a little bit further and only 0.7% of that's Indigenous women. And yeah. it's we we and it's it's tough because it's not a mm-hmm. it's not a candidate short market at the moment. It's a talent short market. I think that's yeah. the big thing. It's a skill yeah. set. We're missing the skill yeah. set. Mm-hmm. And it's okay, what are we doing as a industry to help upskill these candidates that could be potentially fit for a role? or to better position them out to our customers or our clients and give these people that may not have a seat at the table a bit more of a voice. Mm-hmm. Um, like Fitted for Work, the, there's a um, not-for-profit that I partner with that they're all about, that they're all about getting women back in the workforce. Mm-hmm. Women that may be over 55 and they've spent their time just being a mum and mm-hmm. they, they're now divorced and they need to get back into work. Um, women that have been a part of domestic abuse and yeah. uh, had a tough slog. And it's, they, they are starting to skill them up to then float them out to recruitment agencies and mm-hmm. go, okay, we've got these people, we've trained them for you. This is their skill set. Do you have a role for them? And I mm-hmm. think that's what we could probably be doing as an industry is looking at, okay, where are our gaps? And it, it may come at a cost to the business, but yeah. is it that we're doing, I, I was having a chat, last week about this and it's do we do we talk to the recruitment industry about getting a graduate program for school leavers that may not want to go to university but may want to become a recruiter or they may want to go into Mm -hmm. a particular workforce Mm -hmm. and you start bringing them into your agency and give them work experience or something like that that you're and you open it up to and start school programs where you're going around to schools and promoting your business and stuff how are we how are we finding this next generation of talent um and giving the rest of the people a seat at the table because we've done yeah. really good at getting women a seat at the table and queer men, like we, everyone sort of barged their way in there, but then you've got transgender folks, indigenous folks, um, per, people of color. Where, where are we really pushing that diversity and inclusion piece? Yeah, no, it's such a good point. And I think as an industry and as recruitment business leaders and agency owners we have so much power and I think it's so easy to fall back on 
doing what we know. And it's so easy to say there is a talent shortage and all of the people who I'm looking for, they are in roles and they, um, they're not looking for work at the moment. Therefore, I have no one. And I know Dylan Alcott, who is the Australian of the year. Um, he does a huge amount of work around the dis dis disabled um, and the um, community, anyone, um, the disability community, because there's so many, I think his stats are something like 1.2 million people who are out of work who are disabled. And it's like, why aren't we considering those people? Why aren't we tapping into that market? And as you said about the, the domestic violence charity, we do an incredible, um, we do work with an incredible charity called Metal. Um, they're Metal Gifts and they essentially have um, various different sites where they employ women who are escaping um, situations of domestic violence and they obviously need to be able to earn money for, for themselves and to obviously um, put them and their families and pay rent and so they're employed by um, this non-profit this social enterprise and they produce the most it's the gifts that we give to all of our clients um, and candidates they are the most beautiful hampers they are the most gorgeous gift boxes but it's obviously full-time employing um, women who've been through this experience and I think think I was talking to my mum about it weirdly last night because um, the Lotus team have been um, mentoring um, with a, an organisation called The Social Outfit and their social enterprise as well. But it's refugees who go through a 12 week pro programme who basically get them job ready at the end. And at the end, they go to companies like Zimmerman and various different fashion brands that align with it. And they go and they help out and they do sort of work experience. And then a few of them have gained full time employment from that. And so my mum and I were talking about things like buying candidate and client gifts it is one of those things that every recruitment agency does it and I just went you know what I don't want to do tat I don't want to create landfill with lotus branded plastic tat what that goes into the ground that goes against my ethics of landfill plastic shite anyway I what can we do that's more impactful and we've worked with these guys for years we have given them tens of thousands of dollars over the years with the gifts that we buy but at the end of it we have these stunning gifts who make an impact on the people that we give them to. So I think you're right. I think that's absolutely tiny. And even as you're speaking, it honestly is setting light bulbs off in my brain of like, what more can we be doing? Like, of course we could be doing more. There's so much more we could be doing around engaging um, so many different people from so many different communities. And I think the key thing that I took from that as well is the representation. It isn't just diversity. Yeah, we were diverse. Sure, we've got people from different countries. We've got people from different backgrounds. That's not what it is. It's uh, Is there any clear representation in of the people who are minorities and who, who need support to break in the same way that women and obviously the gay community and queer community have as well so yeah it's a, a very very valid point and it's definitely sparked and I think we need to keep talking about it because if it goes unspoken about we don't do anything about it whereas if we're speaking about it it's planting seeds and things come from that yeah I think it's exactly right I think it's everything started with a conversation but then if the conversation dies it goes nowhere and yes. it's just it's it's getting it's almost getting brains trust because i think people are afraid to share their ideas but when they're doing something good it's definitely they're more willing to sit around a table like what can we be doing as an industry what can we be doing to better our our footprint and it's not just our footprint like in terms of environmental it's what are we doing about our footprint what legacy we're leaving behind it's yeah. what do we want to be known for now and i think we've we've broken down so many barriers across diversity inclusion and equality mental health i think they've all become massive focuses but it's we've hit the top layer mm -hmm. what are we doing to dive under it now and yeah, yeah. really dig in mm -hmm. and no better time than when as you said there is a skills and talent shortage it's like up, we're up against it we're all trying to find the best people so now is the time to think outside the box not in a time where there's abu an abundance of people now is the time and we need to for various reasons well it's there's we've got our lowest unemployment rate ever which is fantastic yeah. as an industry ever but we've still yeah. got 3.2 million job seekers people that are saying i am looking for a job mm. and it's it may be that there's um, a skill like uh, not being skilled enough or um, their talents may be niche, but it's mm -hmm. okay. How do we take that person? And can we train you up to work in a call center? Can we train you up to, have you ever thought about sales? Have you thought about this, getting them in at the ground and then helping them to work their way up. Mm -hmm. And it's that candidate care piece post the placement. 
Yeah. It's what are you doing once you've placed them to ensure that they're going to have a positive impact with your brand post that. Yeah. And it's, are you checking with them? Are you taking them out for a lunch six months later to check how things are going? Are you seeing, hey, is there anything that you may need from us in terms of skills? What content are you putting out as a business? Is it just a spray and pray method? Or are you saying, okay, these are our data analysts. Let's get somebody to come and do a webinar or a talk um, tailored to data analysts and bring them in so then they can upskill themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different there's a lot of different ways of thinking about it, and I think the issue is is that best practice of anything takes a lot of work and it takes yeah. a lot of effort and it takes a lot of care, and I think there's lazy roots and people prioritize things and other things fall off, and I think with that whole candidate care piece, like there's things at Lotus that we value so much, and whilst the admin or the candidate check ins are often the thing to fall off in other agencies, it's just always remained a priority because it's driven from the top with us and so it's it's one of those things where it's like it's out of sight out of mind and as I said it's constant hard work constantly looking at your culture how you treat people your processes your continuous improvement your tech adoption like all of that is so much effort and I'm always tired (laughs) (laughs) care because they care because we hire the right people who should care who absolutely want to treat people well who are values based who are good people and so when you have that sort of approach by everyone and it's standardized and it's your culture then it's 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 worth the effort because then you start to do things but there's still a gap there's still a lot more that we can do as i said yeah it's it's well look like i'm going to do a bad pun here but like when you make it easy for your employees that is when work isn't work because they don't feel like they're working. Like they don't feel like they're working. They feel like it's just a seamless process. Obviously there's these little nuances, but you're like, ah, whatever. Like it's makes life a lot easier for people. Yeah, 100%. And I love that you uh, threw in the name of the podcast there. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I live for the, the cheesy puns. Um, and before we, we, I honestly could speak to you all day, Josh, um, but I do. I am mindful of the fact that I've already stolen you at 8.30 a.m. after an award ceremony and the day, the whole day is ahead of us. Um, before we do finish up, can you think about the the anyone who isn't feeling like their employer is valuing their mental health they're not feeling happy or settled where they are they feel like something needs to change what advice would you share with someone who is in that that way or feeling that way the 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 blunt part of me would say just leave it's quite simple if it's not filling your cup why would you stay like i'd spent far too long in a role five years where i was not happy i was burnt out across the whole company the management team didn't notice it. A lot of people were leaving. But then it's the other piece of me is, have you had the conversation? Like, mm-hmm. Have you sat down? Because I think a lot of the management style that I'm seeing across the industry now is a lot more approachable. I think we're getting a new generation of leaders come in. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've we've seen everyone sort of change their mindset. It's have a look at it. What is the skeleton plan for what what's going to make you happy i think that's the big piece you need to pinpoint where the burnout's happening or where the frustration lies and then give the, give the business a chance to to fix it yeah. give the business a chance to look at it and say okay we can see that these are our challenges that we are facing and it it comes back to what my boss said 80 percent of the time it's on you to to help fix it 20 percent, let them give you the guidelines or let them give you the commitment of what they will change so there's two paths one if you're comfortable talk to them two leave (laughs) you're the only option three suffer (laughs) three suffer (laughs) in silence nothing nothing will change (laughs) don't don't (laughs) heed any advice and find yourself in the same situation in a year's time (laughs) mental health (laughs) You'll be that person at dinner every single week. We all have a friend that hates their job and is always complaining about their job and you're like, just leave. (laughs) Gosh, you need to send that person. You need to send that friend this podcast. (laughs) Yeah, he's he's our audience. (laughs) Um, No, it's it's so true. Life is too short. Hey, we want to enjoy what we do and try not to burn ourselves out in the process. It's, uh, It's a big focus. 
Oh, well, thank you so much for coming on. I am very, very grateful to you. Um, and particularly given that we've had to shuffle a couple of times, it's so, so lovely to catch up. I know that everyone's going to love listening to this. Um, and I am very grateful to you for your time and also for being a fan and an avid listener. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was probably one of the first people to message you when I got launched. <laughs> this was an absolute... Fair. <laughs> this was an absolute treat. It was very much so worth the wait on my end. Aww. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you.